Okay. Can you hear me well? Hi, everybody. My name is Nadia. Thank you very much for your representation. And let's talk about abstract art. Um, for the beginning, I would like to offer you a kind of a game. Let's, together with me, let's try to distinguish. Is it a conven conventional art or a kind of self-expression? Do you think it is an expensive abstract art or the or Okay, so raise your hands, those of you who think this is an expensive abstract art. Thank you very much, but you're wrong, this is a drawing of a three years old child. <laughs> Let's try again. What do you think about it? Isn't it uh, is who, who of you think this is an art? Yeah, you're right. This is William de Kooning, maybe you saw it. It's a composition, estimated price. 200 million US dollars. Any guesses about that? Do you think it's a child work? No, yes, no. Good, really art experts. Sam Gilliam, Coffee Time, 1977, estimated price 300,000 US dollars. But enough games, let's talk about abstraction. What is it, an abstraction? Abstraction is a kind of generalization. The um, breaking apart from insignificant, the attempt to take away all the small insignificant, I insignificant details and to, uh, we all know the verb, to generalize, to summarize, to take the content, the most important things. Well, abstract art exists since 19th century and uh, the attempts to generalize the art have been done earlier in the middle of I 18 cen uh, 19th century by the British painter William Turner, he tried to make such a landscape where we can hardly uh, distinguish, hardly recognize the locomotive rushing through the rain, through the uh, fog. This is very early for this time because in the 19th century the art academies and the schools were overwhelmed with a kind of conservative, realistic or academic art and uh, which had actually nothing to do with the common needs of society of that time. So the artists, they tried to find a new form of self-expression, the new form of style, which would be more actual to that time. We all know well that uh, in, 17, in the 1870s, Impressionism uh, did a kind of uh, a revolution in art, but the very important event for the abstract art was actually the discovery of the cave Altamira. With this find, the primitive art was discovered, which meant that uh, 15,000 years ago, or even 35,000 years ago, the realistic art, the kind of that art, existed. So, if we compare these images, the bison, which was painted 15,000 years ago, and the bull of Paulus Potter Jr. from this painting of 17th century, is that really the difference of six and a half thousand years in between? Is it really six and a half thousand years of artistic evolution? So, which, which uh, the discovery of Cave Altamira was the biggest problem for the uh, artists of this time, where they had to rethink the problem of the art perception. If the art had, hasn't changed that much, did they still need to paint the nature once again? whether there was a need to repeat the nature, repeat each leaf, each flower. So they moved to the abstraction, through the impressionism, to the new form of art, of self-expression, of a uh, kind of deconstruction in art. Maybe you are surprised now by seeing such a realistic work by Vasily Kandinsky. Vasily Kandinsky is actually considered as the father of abstraction, the lord of European ab abstraction. But as many other artists of classic abstraction, he was starting with a realistic art like that. He was born in Odessa and moved, uh, which is you can see in this painting, and moved to Moscow, where he was really impressed by the cathedrals, by the city itself, by the Russian art, by the museums. And uh, as many other rich boys from the merchant family, he studied law in, in Moscow University. And as he was in his magister studies, he was sent to the kind of expedition to Russian villages where he had to uh, study the remains of uh, villages' law or legal system. There, in northern of, north of Russia, he 
realized he wanted to be only a painter, but not a lawyer. He was so much impressed by Russian art, Russian folk art, fairy tales and legends, icons, and another subjects of uh, people's art, which, uh, that it impressed him for all his life. I will quote, as he entered one of the old Russian village houses, as he wrote later, the painting has surrounded him and he was inside of the painting. During all his life and creative way, he uses some motifs and figures from the Russian folks out, like, like here, for example, Bride, Russian Beauty, 1903. Here you can see that he combines the old Russian motif, the motif of Russian fairy tale, with the abstract um, elements, like downstairs, you can see. Uh, in his uh, creative evolution, the figurative art, and this is uh, certainly figurative art, can we can meet it during all his life. So he is a consequent abstraction artist, but also uses the element of figurative art. For him, uh, the motif of the rider on a horse, and especially the motif of the warrior struggling with the evil, struggling with the demon, with the dragon, is very important. It's really complicated to uh, recognize, but this motif, the St. George from 1911, the totally abstract composition is actually inspired by the old Russian icon, St. George fighting with a dragon, from the collection of Kandinsky. Because since this northern exhibition, he was collecting art, uh, old Russian art, and he was taking it with him in Munich, in Switzerland, in France, and they were always accompanying him. Let's have a look at this active diagonal. It's a copy of St. George. Same like here, and we can even recognize the figure of the rider there above and the silhouette of a dragon downstairs. One of the most famous uh, paintings of Kandinsky, the first abstract composition, was painted in Mu near München in Murnau, in which he tried to combine the different colors as a language, because he invented the language of colors. For Kandinsky, white meant uh, pureness and calm, black, gloomy thoughts and alarm, and red is nervousness. Uh, every color had a special significance, and combining of its colors meant uh, to create a special emotional message, emotional idea. One of the most famous and highli highlights of Kandinsky is a composition number seven. Today is in the Tretiakov Gallery in Moscow. This a huge composition was written only in four days, but the pre preliminary works took uh, many months and 30 sketches and studies. He was working in oil and watercolors. He was photographing consequently each part of his preliminary work and the uh, he was documenti documenting that process to create this huge composition three meter to two only in four days. Here, many art critics and art histori historians distinguished later a lot of biblical motifs, like for example, the arrival from the dead, the bloomsday flood and paradise garden. Kandinsky, as many other artists of abstract art, commented his paintings and he was writing lots of uh, theoretical uh, messages about this art, as well as many books which, which were written uh, also in German. And uh, almost for every painting we can find a special comment which helps us to understand this painting. Um, but now... Let's have a look to another famous abstract artist, Piet Mondrian. It's a Dutch and later American artist. He was uh, starting his career in the, mil um, in the beginning of 20th century. And as we can see, he started as well as a um, rather traditional artist, inspired by Van Gogh, what we can see in this mill lit with the sun, inspired by post-impressionism, by pointillism and many uh, still traditional uh, movement in art. But already in 1908, 1910, he started to develop a special, very special style, which is clearly to see in this evolution of compositions with a tree, like the red tree of 1908, uh, apple tree of a gray tree of 1911, 
and the apple tree in 1913. We can see like uh, in five years, his style evolves to the very special geometrical form, which will lead later to the neoplasticism, the special style he invented and developed. Look at this apple tree, which becomes more and more geometrical and brings the painter to the pier and ocean of 1916. From this point, we can talk about neoplasticism. Neoplasticism is a special style invented by Piet Mondrian, which was a kind of self-reduction, self-limitation to the very special color palette. What we can see here, the primary three colors, red, yellow, and blue, and the primary two directions, vertical and horizontal, are the main instruments of neoplasticism. Piet Mondrian said that neoplasticism was a kind of a pure beauty, a beauty which doesn't need any other further uh, means of expression. And uh, Piet Mondrian is very well known with these um, such compositions. Another example I would like to show, it's a very famous American uh, artist of um, abstract ex expressionism or abstract artist, it's a Jackson Pollock or Jack the Dripper. And, and now you can see him in his atelier. Well, he also started as a painter with a admiring to Pablo Picasso and many other artists of classical modern. He was working with the easel, traditionally painting on the special surfaces of canvases, but as he moved and built him his atelier, where he had so many space, he was rethinking this process and putting the canvas on the floor. Moving around the canvas, uh, putting the oil with the special brushes and sticks on it, uh, which uh, didn't let the oil flow. And uh, Jackson Pollock was in a kind of a psychological trance. He was not interrupting his work till it was ended. That could um, take many hours, during like for five or six hours, till he thought the painting was uh, ready. I would like to quote Jackson Pollock as well, because I find that this quotation is very similar to what Kandinsky was writing 15 y 50 years before. In 1947, uh, he told to the magazine Possibilities, on the floor I am more at ease, I feel nearer, more part of the painting, since this way I can walk around it, walk from the floor, sides and literally be in the painting. This is the uh, being inside of the painting which make uh, Jackson Pollock and Kandinsky the abstract artists from the one uh, position. And uh, I would like to offer some keys to read the abstract art, to understand it better. So I would like to offer to read the biography of an artist in any way, because I personally do not believe that abstract art can exist without an academical education. So when we read the biographical biography of an artist, we understand where he or she studied and what which was her development of an artist. We also always need an idea of an abstract art, because if we don't have an idea, we don't understand what it's about. Uh, the idea is normally told by the artist itself, himself or by the critics or by some articles. So abstract art, it's a kind of art uh, we have to be prepared for that. Because if not, we can just not get it. We have to look for a kind of a system, ideology or philosophy the system like the color uh, language of Kandinsky or like the special style of Jackson Pollock or the system of limitation by Piet Mondrian. This system helps us to understand the idea of the painter and the uh, language. And uh, what I think one of the most important things about it is the creative evolution of an artist. When we have seen Kandinsky, he started as a realist, a realist Piet Mondrian started as post-impressionist, and they came to the abstract idea in searches, in a long artistic way, which helps us to understand that this or that abstract piece of art appeared not just like that. Thank you very much.
So thank you, Nadia. Very interesting. And um, yeah, I've seen some of those pieces of works of art in, in various galleries around the world. So um, two things. Firstly, there's some people still sit at the back. There are some seats around here at the side if you'd like to work your way through it. No escaping. Um, uh, secondly, are there some at the front as well? Um, and secondly, are there any questions from the audience? For Nadia? Yes? Uh, so does it mean that a newbie can never make money with abstract arts? Uh, sorry, the question was, is there no way that a new person into art can make money with art? Can make money with art, certainly, but it's about... Um, so the question of making money in art is a little bit different dimension, but it's one of the most complicated, I think, I find, personally. But uh, there is a lot of new persons in art who make great money with it. Okay. Thank you. Any, sir? Uh, well, when you're defining uh, neoplasticism, you basically said, um, or talk mostly about the scarcity of the material used, either just a certain number of colors, or maybe, uh, well, as few a material as possible in order to make the neoplastic art. So how do we differentiate that from minimalism? So just for the video, can I repeat the question? So the question I think there was, how do we differentiate neoplasticism from minimalism? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Well, I would say that neoplasticism, it was a style what was invented by Pete Mondrian personally, with a special term, neoplasticism is a ne new plastic style. And minimalism, it's a kind of a style which we can uh, use in our life, in our interior, in our philosophy, ideology, in literature, it's a different dimension as well. So the style in art or the personal, very special individual um, development like neoplasticism, you can divide it just like that because it was an invention with its, its name by Pete Mondrian. He didn't invent minimalism. And uh, in, the in, the, in the dimension of a language, Pete Mondrian described himself what he calls neoplasticism. It's a kind of, um, how we call it, patent. He said, well, I invented neoplasticism, and that means that and that and that. And everybody after him can say, well, neoplasticism, it's a kind of minimalism, for sure. But it's a very special name, special time, and a special person, first of all. OK, thank you. Any other questions? One more. Suppose a computer could do abstract art with concrete art, like you give them <coughs> a very a photo photography or something and it will just abstract details away. Would there be some value in these kind of pictures? Or is it just because there's no history to this computer or computer program that it's completely worthless? Well, it's very subjective. For me personally, not. But for the people who invented computer, who is able to make art, of course. I would never buy a thing of a piece of art made by computer, but I do buy some computers for me. Well, it's uh, you know, it's about the hand of a painter. It's about the idea. It's about uh, well, what I was talking about. It's classical art. It's a museum art. But since that time, there is so many things which are not in the museum and still are called art, and they are art. It's about also. It's about the clever person, the curator or art historian will say, well, this computer is very good, very talented. It's certainly art and will cost one million US dollars. And maybe someday we find a person from another place who will buy that. It's uh, also always the um, uh, problem of value. Okay, good. One, one last question, then we have to move on. Thank you. I was always curious, who does the assessment of the price? I mean, uh, how the price for the big pop sacadas is formed? You the mean so the question which was, how do we price art? Um, you mean today? Yeah, exactly. Like the auction houses, the um, activity of people around this piece of this or that piece of art, some ex extremely successful um, art critical articles. It's a little bit old technology. Today it's about yeah, auction houses and uh, this kind of marketing. But what we are, we are talking about is really museum art and costs very much money. It's a little bit different. It's more complicated to discuss it about today's art. Who makes the, mon the prices for that? Okay, guys, I'm sorry, we're going to have to move on. But there is a coffee break and you can grab hold of Nadia while she's had a beer 
and then ask her more questions about the philosophy of art because there's three questions I want to ask her as well. So that was really interesting. Thank, thank you very you much, much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.